Welcome to The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and so much more. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Now sit back and enjoy the show. Today, my special guest is Elaine Pohlfeldt, and we're going to be discussing her helpful new book, The Million Dollar One-Person Business, Make Great Money, Work the Way You Like, Have the Life You Want. Elaine, thanks for joining us on today's show. Thank you, Sean. It's great to be here. We've been able to talk for a few minutes and just get to know each other before we jump into the interview. And now I was excited beforehand, but now I'm really excited to have you share your story and, and share your book with my listeners. So first off, since this is your first time on my show, would love to have you share what you might call a bit of the Elaine Pofelt origin story. What are a few things we should know about you? I'm a business journalist. I've been writing about entrepreneurship for many years. I was a senior editor at Fortune Small Business Magazine for about eight years and went freelance about 10 years ago. Most of the stuff I write is about entrepreneurship and careers. And I contribute to Forbes, CNBC. I've written for Inc. Magazine, Money the Economist Intelligence Unit, and a lot of publications along those lines. I'm very interested in the future of work, and my interest in this book came out of that somewhat. In my personal life, I am a mother of four. I have four kids ages seven to, actually, sorry, eight. <laughs> yeah, we just had a birthday, eight to 14. And I like to do Taekwondo with two of my daughters. That's my hobby. So nice to tell you a little bit about myself. Thank you for that. For me, I'm just always curious kind of what the life of every author looks like behind the scenes. You don't normally get that in the bio. So I appreciate you filling me in and it, you know, gives us a little more context for who you are and maybe some of what drives you. So always fascinating. And again, referring back to when we were getting started before we recorded the interview, I was teasing you that most people probably think you have a large family, yet my family is more than twice the size of your family. So glad to connect with an author with another large family as well today. I'm really impressed at how you do it all, Sean. That's incredible. Hats off to you because we sometimes the chaos in my house is just overwhelming. <laughs> I can only imagine. I don't know if we're any more organized than you, but my wife is amazing and she keeps the, the household running behind the scenes. So Lynette, if you listen to this interview, hats off to you, hon. You do an amazing job keeping us in clean clothes and food. And if I was trying to run all that, in addition to everything else I do, the kids would be running around starved and half naked probably so <laughs> oh, that's a lot of, that is a lot of laundry i will tell you <laughs> it is it is i would love to get into a bit of your your backstory as far as when did you fall in love with writing or, or editing you know is this something like at an early age where did you think i was going to be a writer or or where did that kind of pop into your life I'm one of those lucky people that always knew what I wanted to do. From the time I was five years old, I was writing stories, and I always knew I wanted to be a writer. And I never really came across anything else that I liked doing as much. So I just sort of kept at it. I was on the school newspaper in high school, and then I worked on my college newspaper, and it just kept continuing. <laughs> Maybe it was lack of imagination. I don't know. But I got hooked. And I just found I, I love interviewing people and hearing their stories and telling their stories, sometimes when they aren't able to tell it themselves. And it just never got boring for me. A follow-up question to that, when did the intersection of writing and business come together for you? Because obviously, if, if somebody takes a look at your bio on the book, they can see you've written for a lot of financial and business theme sorts of publications. So when did those two things begin to come together? It would have shocked me when I was in my early 20s if I knew I was going to be a business writer. I remember actually going on an interview at the Daily News in New York and being asked, what did I want to cover? And I said, anything other than business, because I thought business was so boring. But what happened was I worked in Jersey City and Patterson, New Jersey, which are cities that are economically challenged or maybe less so now than they were at the time. And I started to understand how important business was to the community. I remember in Jersey City at one point, a supermarket closed down and it really was almost like a community hub. Jobs left that neighborhood. People couldn't get healthy food in their neighborhood easily. And it really had a ripple effect through the whole community. And I started to see how important it was 
for community life. And I covered hard news for about seven years. And a lot of times I was the reporter who was knocking on someone's door after a fatal fire or that sort of thing. And after that period, I started to feel a little burned out, honestly. It was just so much sadness that I wanted to do something light and fun. And I always thought fashion was kind of fun and light. And so somehow I got a job as a fashion editor at Women's Wear Daily in New York, complete pivot. And I, you know, it was fun, but I realized it was a little too light for me. <laughs> so I did it for a little over a year. But along the way, I discovered that I really enjoyed learning about the businesses of the fashion designers. And I became friends with one designer, Jean-Paul Saramont. And I remember helping him with his business plan at one point after we became friends. And I found that it was really fascinating and I realized to live that creative vision, you do need to master the business side of things. And it, it sort of came together when I connected business to people. So that led me to eventually taking a job at Success Magazine, where I worked as an editor for a while. And then eventually I, I went to Fortune Small Business. And I kind of never left that, that, <laughs> that beat. Well, that's a fun journey. You've gotten to write on a diverse range of topics. That's quite the varied paths you've taken to get to where you are today. It all comes together, though. You know, it's all life. And I think it's all connected. And, you know, as you get older, you start to see all the different ways that it is, sometimes in mysterious ways. But it, it's really interesting stuff. You'd mentioned that you have a fascination looking at kind of the future of business. And uh, I think your book is definitely an important contribution to the conversation about where we seem to be going in this kind of gig economy that has, uh, you know, seems like it's risen overnight, but it's been in the works for many years but before we get to that, I would love to just hear a bit about kind of the story behind the book. Was there some kind of a, an aha moment or, you know, a spark where you're like, ah, this is the book I need to write next? How did you uh, get started down the path of writing the million dollar one person business? Well, Sean, it was kind of an accident. I write a blog for Forbes and I write five blogs a month and I always seem to end up writing them all at the last minute. I have good intentions every month. <laughs> and then it's like the 30th and I'm still writing them. And one day I was looking around for that last idea of the month and I came across Census Bureau statistics on non-employer businesses. I write about the freelance economy and they showed what revenue one-person businesses and partnerships with no W-2 employees were bringing in. And as I kind of looked at the tables, I was really surprised to see that some of them were bringing in more than $1 million. They were in the range of $1 to $2.49 million. There were even a few, less than 400 that were bringing in over $5 million. <laughs> a lot of them are hedge funds, by the way. But I got really curious about what the ones in that $1 to $2.49 million range were actually doing. So you could see the NAICS codes, that's the industry codes the government uses, and identify, okay, they're in manufacturing, they're in retail, et cetera. So I wrote a post about it, and people started writing to me and saying, I'm really curious. I want to know a little bit beyond just retail. Like, are they doing e-commerce? What kind of retail? What are they selling? And I had no way of finding that out because the Census Bureau protects the identity of the people who fill out those census forms, as I'm sure we all like it. We, <laughs> we wouldn't want our personal stuff shared with the public. So I wrote to my readers and I said, if you're one of these businesses, people are curious, what are you doing? And so they started to write to me. And I wrote a blog about five, I think, of the businesses. And it went completely viral. There were over 300,000 page views. And I, it was almost like I remember having my phone on the table and it felt like it was going to leap off the table, you know, with all the emails coming in. I never had a post like that before. And I thought, wow, people are really interested in it. And I think what it came out of was it's really hard to be a one-person business. Most of the small businesses in this country are one-person businesses. But all the systems set up to encourage business are for the job-creating businesses. And it's almost like we're these pesky little businesses, <laughs> you know, that... That nobody wants. But this is what people want to do. I mean, I, I truly believe that when people start a one-person business, it's not because they can't be the next Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, not everybody can be, obviously, but they like having small and lean lifestyle businesses. It, it suits them very well. And I thought, 
well, maybe I can dig into this a little bit and figure out what is making these businesses so successful because we can all learn from them. They're doing something right that a lot of businesses aren't. There are a lot of businesses in the U.S. that are one-person businesses that are not breaking the median income, which means it's really hard for the owners because they may have to buy health insurance, which is expensive, and we, we could talk about that a little later. They don't have unemployment insurance. So if their work dries up, say they're a contractor for one company, they might work as many hours as their next door neighbor who has a traditional job, but they don't have any protection. Their only protection is really making more money. And it's sad to say that we're just, freelancers are left out of the social safety net. They have very little protection. So they have to be pragmatic, I think. I mean, hopefully policies will change over time. But in the 10 years I've been a freelancer, I've seen almost no action. So we're living right now. We have to, you know, we have to deal with what is. The only way I can think of to change this is to make more money. And so I talked to these entrepreneurs about what they were doing. And that's what this book shows people how to do is doing what you're doing or doing something new. How do you amplify your efforts so that you can get more out of them? And not so that you can be the richest person in the world or that sort of thing. You know, it's, it's not about greed or having more than other people. It's, so you have some control over your life and you have agency and you're not desperate. And if something comes up, an emergency dental bill, it's not going to throw your whole family off and create a crisis. You'll have that cushion. You can retire. If your kids are going to college, you can pay for it. That's really the goal of this book. And that was how it came about. Well, I love that story. You know, a couple years ago, I used to hear of a lot of books that came out of, say, a blog post or an article. And, you know, just when I think that is going to dry up or there, or there aren't going to be new posts and new ideas that go viral, in the last three or four months, I've heard of five or six books that have been done well and have been very popular. Just like your story, they wrote an article for a particular news website and it just went crazy. And they're like, hey, there could be a book idea here. So I love that story. I'm, I'm glad that those types of mediums aren't dried up anew. As a guy who works in the book industry, I'm glad that new book ideas are still coming from blog posts and articles across the web. One of the things I really loved about your book is that the different business owners that you profile and the, and the businesses you talk about, these are relatable people. I mean, it felt like it could be my neighbor next door, my neighbor across the street. And I just found that really refreshing in the sense that so many of the books you know that you read today about entrepreneurship and starting a business how many more profiles do we need of Mark Zuckerberg or Gary Vaynerchuk or other people who are larger than life and amazing? And yes, we can learn from them. But the scale of their business is so large at this point, it's really hard for the average person to relate to what they're doing or relate to how they launch their business. So again, that was just really refreshing. I'd be curious to hear for the businesses, business owners that made it into the final iteration of the book. What were your criteria for choosing those lucky few? Because I, I know when you're researching and writing a book, you have way more data and way more kind of stories that then will ever end up in the final product. So how did you even find a way to narrow it down to those handful of businesses and business owners that make it into the book? That's a really good question, Sean. There, there are over 30 businesses in the book, but I definitely did interview more. One criteria I looked at was, are they profitable? Because I think... The businesses that aren't profitable, you, I mean, you could spend, for instance, a fortune on Facebook advertising and get yourself to 1 million in revenue, but you could be losing a lot of money. So I looked for profitability. I didn't always know it in every case, but I looked in the cases where folks didn't share that information. I looked for all, you know, all indicators suggesting to me after many years of business journalism that they were at break even or close to profitability. When people actively told me they were still losing money, I decided not to include them yet. They're, you know, who knows what I'm going to write in the future because they're still in that learning curve. Like, how do I do this and not lose money? You know, because I think for most people, they do want a profitable business. They want to take money out of it and live on what they make. I also look for businesses that other people could do. So if they were in a very, very special and niche field that no one else can really learn from. I didn't feel that would be as useful. I picked the more relatable stories. I picked businesses where someone didn't need very, very specialized credentials that would be very time consuming to get, you know, like a very advanced degree or things like that. Because on, on that really high end, 
of the $5 million businesses and up. And some of them are actors and actresses, you know, of a very special gift or hedge fund managers. Those are things that like with the actors and actresses, you're just maybe born with that talent. Maybe you can develop it, but not everybody is going to have that a hedge fund manager. I mean, that's a very specialized type of a skill. So these are the ones that a lot of people could do. So I, I, I try to make it useful. I would agree with that. I've started several businesses through the years and have lots of entrepreneurial friends. So we're always brainstorming and throwing out new ideas. And like every five pages, I'm writing a note I'm like, oh, I could do that. Oh, that sparked these three additional ideas. So throughout the whole book, I was just like, oh, yeah, it was very empowering. A lot of books in this space, you kind of can feel overwhelmed about like, wow, that would take a lot of work and be impossible. But again, with with the way you wrote it, the way it comes across, it's it's very empowering and feels like it's doable for just, you know, the the average person on the street, I think, could pick up your book and they could easily start moving in the direction of starting their own business. It is doable. That I mean, it's a really good point because there were people in here who were high school graduates. There were people that were college graduates. There were people from all walks of life. There was no one special background that everyone had demographically. There were people across the age spectrum, men and women, people around the country. It isn't really something unique to any one person. It's more a way of running the business that I found they had in common. And that is what makes it so doable. This one might be a hard question to answer. It's like when you ask a musician, what's their favorite song on an album or, you know, an, <laughs> oh, an no. author who's written a whole series of books, like which, which, which book is your favorite? It's like, which one of your kids do you like the most? But, but I'm going <laughs> to ask this anyway. So of the business owners you profile, which success story lights you up every time you share it? I would imagine there are one or two favorites that kind of have emerged at the front of the pack. Honestly, it is like kids. They're all my favorites. I love all of these stories. I'm trying to think of some that might be relatable to a lot of people in your audience. One of the stories that I like a lot and one of the entrepreneurs I've met in person is Laszlo Nadler. He is somebody who worked at Bank of America in the past. He was a project manager. He's a dad with two kids. He lives in New Jersey. And he was finding, he, he liked his corporate job, but it wasn't really what he wanted to do in the future. And why I like this story, is he, you know, he was a breadwinner. He felt like he had a responsibility to support his family, but he figured out a way to move into an entrepreneurial career with that responsibility going on in the background. I, I, and I, I think it's an important thing for people to realize because a lot of the stories you had talked about, you know, the people on the startup scene, they always seem to be a young person, you know, who has no dependents crashing on their parents' couch, don't have to buy groceries for nine people or, you know, what I mean? so it's different. And, and that can make it seem unattainable for other people. He didn't have other income coming in. So he, on the side, would spend a few hours on the weekend on his business. It's called Tools for Wisdom Planners. And they're paper planners, like those day books where you write down what you want to accomplish that week. And he found a unique niche by talking about what is your life's biggest goal and what is the one action you can take to move you toward that goal this week instead of this long list of your to-dos. And people really liked it. It has motivational sayings in it. And he put it on Amazon, but that didn't happen overnight. It took two years before he could quit his job. And he was tinkering around with the designs and figuring out how am I going to print this and that sort of thing. And finally, he got to six-figure revenue after two years. And then he felt like, okay, I can safely quit my job, still support my family. And now he's at two million in revenue. He's still a one-person business, and and I should say with these businesses, I'm using the government's definition of a non-employer business, meaning no W two. So he has contractors that help him, and I think you'll find that even in businesses that are not million-dollar businesses, like we all have somebody that helps us: our accountant, a bookkeeper, the web designer. You can't. I mean, some people do it all, but I think that's ill-advised. You know, unless you're really at the starting phase where you have no money at all to invest. Usually, there's some things you're not good at, and it's not efficient for you to work on. So he does have contractors, but yeah, he still he has no employees and spends a lot of time with his daughters. I know sometimes. He has daddy daughter day. <laughs> when I'm trying to book a phone call, he's like, oh, that's daddy daughter day. So, which I, I totally respect as a mother with four children. I think it's wonderful, but that's the nice benefit of these businesses. It's that you control 
how you spend your time and you decide what's important to you, not a corporate boss who puts something on your calendar that you didn't know is coming without even asking you and insists that you join a phone call now, you know, and when you were planning to do something with your kids or, you know, go mountain biking if you don't have kids or volunteering or whatever you like to do. You're the one who decides what's important in this lifespan you're given on earth. I liked what you said that he didn't jump ship immediately, that it was uh, a side business that he ran for a couple of years before he went off completely on his own. That's that's always something good to keep in perspective. Not to say that there aren't people who aren't successful that you know jump ship and, or, and just start something new. Everybody's risk tolerance, I think, varies by how, how much they are responsible for. Like you were saying, if you're just a single person crashing on your parents' couch, eating their food or living in their basement, You can probably take some crazier risks versus if you're married and you have children, your risk tolerance and the path you take to get there is probably going to look a little different than that person who is in a completely different life situation. Uh, And we've mentioned this idea of the gig economy. I mean, that's something that has been growing for many years. I mean, we hear a lot of people throwing out the term side hustle where they're, you know, starting a, a business on the side as they're continuing to maintain their existing job. For you, with your perspective, whether it's in the process of writing this book and just with the kind of writing and research you do, if you look back on the last six or 12 months, what sorts of shifts have you seen with kind of the side business, kind of gig economy sort of ventures and maybe project that onto the horizon? Where where do you think we're going future of business wise? I think we're going to see some $10 million one person businesses because one of the most powerful trends affecting Solo entrepreneurs is paid advertising on Facebook, Google, all these other pay-per-click type of things. You can really reach a huge audience without a big budget. And once you can do that, you can always put the team in place of contractors and other types of helpers to fill the orders. So I think like we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. People are getting very, very good at using those systems and hiring people that are good at it to expand their reach. We never really had this before. I don't think people fully understand the magnitude of how important those things are. And I mean, also the tools like just you and I communicating 10 years ago, we probably wouldn't be having this call where you wouldn't be a podcaster and it wouldn't have been easy for us to do this. For, I don't know if you're in your home. I'm in my home from our homes, I think, and you know, have this conversation. I, I reach people all over the world using different tools like this. So those things are very important. I think what may happen, we're getting to a critical mass where there was a US GAO report that came out a few years ago, and it said 40% of the U.S. population is doing some type of contingent work. So they included part-time work in that definition. So that would include some W-2s, but basically not the traditional full-time W-2 job. Didn't mean that was the only work they did. They might also have a full-time job, but you have a lot of people that are basically part of the freelance or gig economy. I, you know, people give it a different name, but basically not working in the traditional job. And we have no real systems in place to protect them. We did have the Affordable Care Act, which made healthcare more accessible to freelancers, but there were also some flip sides to that, you know, which is a lot of them have high deductible plans they can't really afford to use. And now it's in transition. And who knows, you know, who knows where that's going. But I think social policy eventually will have to catch up because you'll have so many taxpayers saying, hey, you know, I pay really high taxes. Why don't any of these systems protect me? Why am I a second class citizen? Because I'm, you know, I'm a hardworking person. I pay my bills. I give back. You know, why am I not given any recognition in all the systems out there that protect all the other workers? So I think that's going to happen. It hasn't really happened yet, but you're going to get to a certain number where people are going to see themselves as a group, which right now we, you know, we see ourselves as a freelance writer or freelance graphic designer, et cetera. But that's going to change, I think. So that's important too. It's funny because the the media I find is very negative about the gig economy. Generally, I bet if you did a study of it and searched all the headlines, it's almost always seen as it's almost like a punishment for work. <laughs> you know, like they, they work under terrible conditions, but It really isn't necessarily, and that's partly what I wanted to show in this book. The gig economy has been very wonderful for me as a woman, because when you think about a woman with four children, 
trying to work in corporate America. I did, but it's really not set up for somebody with a family. It's set up for someone with a family where there's another spouse or partner who takes care of all the other stuff. It's not really set up for someone who has any family responsibilities, ex- you know, except for the very enlightened companies. So for me, my situation is much better than working in any very enlightened company. I can make a great income. I have time for my children. I don't feel abused because I'm not on anyone's payroll. I'm really happy not to be. I don't want to be. I like control of my time. So I don't think that story really gets told. But I think when you talk to freelancers and you look at all the surveys of us, they're happy. I have yet to see a single survey where they're miserable. They would go back to their job and then said, there's always the people that were forced into freelancing. I mean, there is sort of a dark side to labor market trends where you have people that really should be W-2 employees and they're kind of forced into being contractors, usually because they've gotten older and they're expensive for the company and they get kind of like shoved off, you know, into this contractor role and they're not happy because they're not dumb. They understand what just happened to them. Their benefits were taken away. Basically, they have no control over their time, which means they are an employee, but the company isn't acknowledging it. And they usually have sophisticated workarounds, you know, using outside agencies and things like that to make it look like that's not what happened. But the workers are not dumb. They know they're sitting next to somebody, you know, who has the benefits, who's doing the same thing as them. That's kind of the bad side of it. And I think when you see the unhappy freelancers, they're going to mostly be in that category of like a quasi employee, but with none of the good things about being an employee. And, and I would say for any freelancer who's watching this, don't do that. You know, unless you're desperate and it's the only thing you can do to put food on the table, don't take those contract gigs where you really should be a worker. You can, if you're good and you work really hard, you should always be able to find something else because once you give control over your time and you're not, not working for multiple employers, you have no income security. It's like the worst of both worlds. And so hopefully that practice will go away and we'll see more people just going out into these great little businesses where they're maximizing, <coughs> excuse me, their income, you know, and they're in control. Yeah, I think control, freedom, you know, being able to make choices, those are definitely benefits to being on your own and, and working from home. I freelanced for like three years doing PR. And then I actually reached a point in that particular business where I chose to go back inside publishing companies because I'd hit a ceiling where because I'd never worked for a publishing company formally, it impacted the level of business I could grow. And so like I've spent the last five or six years working for a couple of different publishers, doing a bunch of different jobs in marketing and community development and PR. And so I've learned a ton. And you know, I think on the horizon, I will go back into my own business at some point again in the future. But that's an example of where I was freelancing made a choice to gain experience and grow my knowledge inside a company. But long term, I plan to put that back to use on my own again. That's an interesting trend, actually. I think we're seeing more people doing what you did, which is go in and out of the traditional work world. I think you know, one of the things that is perpetuated by us always focusing in the media on these unicorn stories of overwhelming startup success is we don't realize there's a lot of people that are on a continuum where, you know, they could be happy in corporate America, or they could be happy in their own business, and they might toggle between the two their whole career, like you did, you saw it was a valuable thing to be inside the business and learn things. Maybe you'll take that outside the business at some point, or maybe not. You know, it's about choices, really. And I think now companies are realizing that just because you were freelancing for a few years, it doesn't mean you're this sort of unruly, unemployable person because that was the stereotype you know once you work for yourself you, no one can ever manage you and I, I think that that's a real big myth because a lot of times being your own manager you become extremely attuned to what clients want and that's basically the same thing as being attuned to what a boss wants yeah you definitely understand the challenges of people in many roles throughout an organization because often if you're a one-person business you get to wear a bunch of different hats that you've never gotten to wear before. So I choose to look at people who've been entrepreneurial. I'm I'm fascinated by them. I mean, it it excites me to think of hiring somebody who's had some level of success and been doing freelancing for a time because they understand the challenges of business and, and operations in a whole way that the average college grad who's maybe, if you're lucky, flip burgers at McDonald's, they've got no context or, um, or clue about those challenges versus somebody who's had to wear all the hats sell their business, do all the marketing, 
do the accounting part and just deal with all that. You learn a lot because you have to, but it makes you a much more well-rounded person, whether you're working inside an, another organization or you just understand how to operate and run in the business world in a whole new way that somebody who's just been an employee their whole life, they just can't even begin to understand. No, it's funny because you can't, I don't think you can fully understand it until you live it, until you're really living on what you make as a freelancer and you understand what that means. Like if you slack off for a week, the next month you're going to have a cash flow problem. We all have things happen in life or whatever, you get sick or something and you, you suddenly realize it's like, You've got to plan for these things. It's on you. But, but once you, you start thinking that way, you do learn to plan. And then when you, if you bring that back into an organization, I think it makes you very valuable because you do understand the financial realities the owner is under, that there isn't a bottomless pit to spend on every project, that you need to work within a certain budget, that you need to get things done. You can't just let them linger because then you can never invoice for them, you know, or that type of thing. It's impossible. I didn't really understand those things until I was out on my own. And I don't think most people will. Well, we've touched on a number of the challenges that people face, but let's dig a little bit more in that area. I want to talk about health care, but let's pick out a few other common challenges, maybe things that you've seen as far as the average person starting a business is going to run up against this as something they didn't know or a problem. The first one that comes to mind for me that a lot of people don't realize is if they go freelance, they're going to have a, could have a very difficult time getting, say, a car loan or financing a house if that's something that's on the horizon for them because banks really are uncomfortable on average giving a loan to somebody who hasn't had a business with like a three to five year continuous track record of success. They see you as a, as a big risk. So that's one that's top of mind for me that I think the average person wouldn't even know that that was going to be a problem. No, you're right. And this is part of the whole thing in society with systems not being in place to recognize that some people don't have traditional jobs. And I found out there's actually a reason for that with the banks. I did a lot of research into this first story. They outsourced the loan approval process to BPOs and in business process outsourcing firms, and it's all automated. So you as the freelancer are messing up their system. <laughs> they, you need to be customized and it costs them more to process that application. So they kind of spit you out. But unfortunately, they're, you know, they're turning away a lot of business that way. And sometimes people, I mean, like the people in my book, they're not multimillionaires, but after all is said and done, when you bring in, you have a million dollars in revenue, maybe what you're taking home after all is said and done with taxes and expenses, you're taking home two hundred to $400,000 a year. That's a nice income. That's a person that can pay their loan, probably, if they're taking out a mortgage, you know, because it's based on income. So I think that will change. And there there are some providers that are starting to address that now. I know of one that was active in a number of states that I wrote about for Forbes at one point, because people are realizing there's more and more people in this category. But this is another reason why you need to earn more, because you probably have to put down a bigger down payment. I remember during the recession, interviewing people that were beyond the one person business. They they were people with, you know, with multi-million dollar businesses who bought houses in New York in cash because they got so frustrated with the loan approval process. I know for us, even when we bought our home and we have very good credit, it took six months. My husband's a real estate appraiser, by the way. And I kept on saying, let's give up. You know, (laughs) this is insane. I was literally down to photocopying these like $200 check deposits in my bank account to prove my income. It was insane. He's like, no, no, we'll just wear them down. We'll give them everything they want. And then they can't say no because he knew the field and he, he was right. But it's crazy, you know, and you raised a point, though, about credit. When you're a freelancer, you have to protect your credit. You cannot be a slacker about paying your bills on time. You have to be a little bit more conservative about how you spend. It's not a fun thing to say, but it's the truth because the bar is so high for you to get credit to begin with that if you don't have that, you're finished. You know, you're really going to have a hard time. I remember even when we originally rented the home that we bought, we were competing against somebody that had lesser credit than we did. And it turned out to be an asset that we had really good credit. So it matters, you know, and it's something like if you want to put something on your priority list, it's that, you know, make sure you have those automated bill pays and things set up so that you don't forget to pay a bill. Let's jump into healthcare. You talk about this a little bit in the book. I'll share a little bit of my own story just to give context. So when I went freelance, 
several years, I guess that would be seven, eight years ago, we went the path of working with a medical sharing ministry called Samaritan Ministries. And so that's the path we've taken for healthcare for our family for quite a few years. And then when I went back inside, I've worked for two different publishers now since I was freelancing back in the day. And the healthcare plans available with either of those publishers were just so poor or the cost for basically a family of 11 people was so extremely high that we would have had to pay, you know, fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 into the plan and deductibles before we would have, would have ever seen a benefit. So for us, that's what has worked well for our family was uh, going with a health cost sharing ministry. And that's been successful for us. So would love to hear a bit about your journey because this, you know, <laughs> Dirty little secrets of being a freelancer, getting a loan can be challenging, but then how in the world do you pay for healthcare? Because healthcare is crazy expensive these days. Well, it is crazy expensive. I remember at one point, we live in New Jersey, so we're one of the highest cost states, and we had to pay, like it hurts me to even say this, $38,000 a year in premiums. This is not even including the out-of-pocket and I remember I was sitting in the exact same seat I'm sitting in now and opening the envelope one year where it was the second year in a row where the premiums went up by $600 a month. And it literally brought tears to my eyes for a second. I was like, oh, like I was just completely stunned. I couldn't believe it. And so we finally went to a high deductible plan and it's about a $7,000 deductible, I think. And it's worked out okay. I mean, it's a lot of out of pocket, but we have four children and I try to alternate where like last year we had a lot of tests and things people needed. We were kind of waiting. So we hit the deductible early. And now this year we're not really doing that much. So we'll build up money in the account. And I think you have to sort of do it strategically if you can. If you have a medical problem, you should never put it off. You go to the doctor and you figure it out later because you have to take care of your health. But it's not right, I think, that it costs that much because when you think about it, right, the median income in the U.S. is like $59,000 a year. So how many people can come up with $38,000? we are lucky that we're a two-income couple, but not everybody has this situation. And, and that's one of the reasons I advocate trying to earn more because there's not really a way around it. The ministries that you talked about, I wrote a story for CNBC about three years ago where I kept on telling the editor I needed more time. I, I was looking for five ways to save money on healthcare. And I kept saying, you know, I'm really sorry, I can't find any. I did a lot of interviews. And finally, I found this one woman who saved 1% on her premiums from the previous year. She was an employer with a scaled up business. And I did find five ways. You know, one of them was, I think the HSAC, what you said was another one. And I thought, wow, you know, I, after that story, I thought it's incredible. I did all their research and there really basically is no way. There's no really substantial way where you can get it down to a, a reasonable cost. And then a couple of years later, someone said, Elaine, I think it was a physician. He's like, I was at a medical conference and they had your article up from CNBC with those. <laughs> I was laughing. I was like, well, this is like the state of the art research. There's nothing else. And that said, it's really sad that it's, it's like that. I have seen places now where I think there's a facility in Oklahoma. It's like a cash only surgical center where they like include the price of a plane ticket to go there. And they, they tell you up front what the prices are and it's, it's much cheaper, but you do have to pay for the surgeries, whatever the, the amount is. And it's always like you know, what a surgery would cost, so like $11,000 or, you know, whatever. So a lot of people would not have that amount of cash to pay. That's a solution for some people that have money, but it's definitely not a scalable solution for everybody because you, you need more people with a lot of cash. But this is why you can't be flaky as a freelancer. Unfortunately, you, can, you know, you really have to, even if you're a creative and I am myself, maybe it's not our nature to sit there and work on our QuickBooks but you have to get good at it or you have to hire a bookkeeper or somebody to keep you focused on, okay, how much do you have coming in? So, you know, you look at it today and you know, basically, okay, next month, this amount is coming in. I don't have enough coming in to pay my premium and other things. So what do I do? You know, the other thing I talked about in the book is ways to sort of take control of your own health. And I know that there are a lot of things that we can't control. I mean, we've all had people in our lives who have had cancer and they had a healthy lifestyle and did nothing that would have contributed to it and they still get sick. We don't know why these things happen, 
But there are some things we can control. We can try to eat healthier. We can try to exercise in some way every day. I'm not an extremist about these things. I, you know, you could say, oh, you have to do CrossFit three times a week. But that puts people off. I think, you know, if you do something every day where you're out moving, you're playing with your kids in the yard and you're moving around, you'll be better off than if you didn't do it. Try to use a stand-up desk if you can sometimes. I just put my computer on a high dresser in my house part of the day so that I'm not always sitting. Take breaks, go for walks, try to eat organic if you can. I think some of the basic things a lot of people don't do because we're so busy. We know we should do them. So if you just think, okay, let me do those things. Spend time with friends. Spend time in your community with other people. That's really good for your health. So isolating at your computer at a laptop is not good. We feel guilty taking breaks from our businesses sometimes, but you should do those things. You should be volunteering at your house of worship or the community organizations you belong to. Those things are really good for your health. I think you could find all kinds of evidence backing up what I'm saying here. But I know it to be true just anecdotally from the people I talked to. And I did find a lot of the people in the book did pay attention to their health. In some cases, because of a health crisis that actually led them to start the business, they realize that when you're a one-person business, if you're sick, the business is closed, basically, right? So you have to protect yourself. And sometimes it means saying no, too. You know, you can have clients just piling on requests. If you're good at what you do, that's going to happen. And sometimes you just have to say, look, I, you know, I'm max out today. I need until tomorrow. And it's hard to say. I know when I first started my business, I never wanted to say no. I was always afraid, oh, they'll never come back if I say I need one more hour. But I've learned that I have to because you'll burn out physically, emotionally, mentally. And plus, you won't have time for your family or for your friends and, or, you know, or going outside or things that make life worth living. It's a good reminder that as we're pursuing creating our own million-dollar, one-person business, part of it is creating a life that we want to be living, a life that we are enjoying, a life that has a lot of fulfillment. And one of the pitfalls of being on your own is you can feel like you have to work 24 seven and you can't ever take your foot off the gas pedal. A uh, great reminder that if we want the pace and what we're doing to be sustainable long-term, we do have to take good care of ourselves. And it does mean we're making choices that are good for our health and choices to spend time with friends and family and do the things that kind of fill us back up so that we can be ready to keep giving day in and day out to our clients and the people that we're serving. So all good reminders, not to say that running your own business, not all negative and pitfalls. We just brought up some of the challenges you might face with financing or healthcare costs. Those are just two things that I think a lot of people just aren't aware of when they're starting out, If especially if they've been a, in a traditional work situation for their whole career. Let's jump now all the way to the end of the book. One of the things I really loved is you have some excellent appendices at the end. Basically, you just need to read through the first 169 pages. You'll get the whole overview of her message, everything she wants you to connect with. And then this last part of the book, just get a notebook, start answering questions that she's asking you to consider. And once you get to the end of that, you'll kind of have your business plan started for starting your own business. So I love that that was at the end and not in the main meat of the book. Talk to us about the appendices. Again, I think they're an absolute goldmine. What was your vision for these? Were you concerned? How would you like to see people use them? Because when we talked before the interview, you weren't quite sure how readers were going to respond. So tell us about that. You know, it's funny. When I was working on the book, a lot of times my son is little, so we would go to the park and I wind up chatting with someone and tell them what I'm working on. They'd say, oh, I would love to start a million dollar one person business, but I need an idea. You know, I know I could do it if I had an idea. So I talked about this a little bit with my editor, and she suggested doing some exercises to help draw it out of people. And it was really fun. I wound up going back to the entrepreneurs in the book to say, how did you come up with your idea? I, I had some hunches based on all the interviews I had done, but I wanted to really get inside their heads because I'm the writer of the book, but I'm not them. And it was really helpful to see how they tapped into their own natural talents. A lot of times, you know, what was so interesting was the business wasn't necessarily something they had done before. There is one couple that they started Tropical Traders Specialty Foods, Rebecca Crones and Luis Zavalos. They're a married couple with two kids. And Rebecca's dad is a beekeeper. And he winds up selling the bees to commercial farms, but he wasn't really doing much with the honey. 
And she has an art history degree. Her husband was working in the restaurant industry. And they're like, why don't we create a business around this honey? There was a problem at the time with adulterated honey in the US and they knew the origins of the honey. So they felt like there was a market for this. And that was how they came up with the business. Another person in the book, Megan Telpner, is a young woman, a young mom who lives in Toronto. And about 10 years ago, she worked in advertising and she went on a trip to Africa and she got sick. And she found out she had Crohn's disease and she was really not happy with how the medical system treats this. And she decided to study nutrition and try to heal herself. And she did. She's actually been in remission for 10 years. She became a nutritionist. She actually went back to school, became a nutritionist. And she's got this wonderful flair for design. And it kind of comes out in her website. She finds these amazing vintage clothing and thrift stores. And it's very colorful. And she created a blog around her own healing journey. And then this led to an academy called the Academy of Culinary Nutrition, where she teaches other people her ways of cooking, nutritionists, and and lay people. That was how her business came about. And a third guy whose story I love, Corey Binsfield, he's a financial planner, but he's also a skateboarder on the side. He's in his 50s. And he, for something better, reminds me of Tom Waits. I, can't, I haven't met him, but just his vibe. And he skateboards around Duluth, Minnesota, which is where he lives, looking for interesting real estate to buy. And he, he buys these small duplexes. He started with one years ago started renting it out, reinvesting the profits. And now he has 116 of these small properties in Duluth, Minnesota. And that's his million dollar one person business. And he calls it skateboarding for dollars. He's even started his own podcast. And now he does consulting to help other people with their properties. And so it's sort of an accident sometimes how people fall into it. I remember he told me he started getting interested in real estate because he he spoke with one of his clients who I believe was a farmer And when he retired, his property was worth more than the business. And he said he was realizing that the people that were retiring were people who had bought property. And he kind of noodled on that for a while. And then that led to his business. And, you know, it happened slowly. That's the other thing I wanted to say is there were some people that were like a one-year success story. That's very common in one of the areas, e-commerce because you can use things like Facebook advertising to really accelerate the growth quickly. But some of these were 10-year overnight successes. And you know what? It didn't matter, right? Because they figured it out. And now the business is a wonderful business and it can support them and they can take vacations and live in economic peace. So you have to be a little bit patient. I would also say one of the things I found is these folks are not such linear thinkers I think in the world of traditional work, we tend to think in terms of hierarchies, climbing the ladder, you do this and it's going to lead to this. They're working in areas that are changing in real time. A lot of them are dependent in new digital technologies. And I I don't mean really advanced technologies. It's things like Facebook advertising or doing webcasts or, you know, things that the average person could learn, maybe with help from their 14 year old, (laughs) but but they can learn. And you have to react in real time. I think sometimes people see these systems that people are selling, like take these five easy steps and you will have a million dollars. You know, I don't believe that those things can work because you and I both know we both had businesses a lot of business is how you interact on a moment to moment basis with your clients, with your projects, with things that are happening in the marketplace and how you interpret them. And these folks are really perpetual learners. They're always kind of reading the tea leaves and saying, okay, I tried this. I did this Facebook ad campaign. It didn't really work when I advertised it to midlife men. So let me try it on young men or, you know, they're willing to experiment And you talked about risk aversion and things. They're across the spectrum. Some are great risk takers. Some really mitigated their risks by the type of business that they ran and did it slowly. But they do pay attention to what's happening in real time. And they're not looking for a recipe. Yeah, I gave some broad guidelines in the book. Like they do use a lot of automation to remove routine tasks. And they take the time to do the setup. Because a lot of people know they should automate things. But how many people do you know really have automated all the things they should have. These people actually mostly do automate them, which is a huge advantage because once you get all that set up, you could save easily a day or two of time every week to do something else with like strategy on the business or just spending time doing something fun that gives you energy, traveling, whatever it is. 
they use contractors and outsourcing so that they're not doing everything themselves. And, and the difference between contractors and outsourcing is with outsourcing, usually it's a service. So it would be like fulfillment by Amazon or one of the stories I love, Harry Ein, he sells swag from his garage. He's a dad in California, $4 million a year in revenue selling those tote bags that have a bank's name on them or those pens with a company name. And it's because he uses a company called I Promote You that, believe it or not, specializes in the back office of swag sellers. Like who knew there were all these swag sellers, but there are, there are right? And, and what he's done is he scaled up his use of that company as his business grew. So in the beginning, he had help X amount of time. And then as he needed more support, then he keeps on increasing it. So that means he has a cash flow to support it because you can't just outsource things if you can't pay the people. I mean, that's, that's one of the little challenges you do. There's like a little tough period in the beginning, and that period might be a year or two sometimes where you really can't afford to do any outsourcing or any hiring of a freelancer. And you put up your basic website using Squarespace or whatever it is on your own, and it looks decent, but it maybe a web designer would do better with it than you, and you get by with it just to get going. But at a certain point, you have to start saying, okay, you know, I could go meet with big company client now. Or I could sit here entering all my data into QuickBooks when I could be paying somebody else X dollars per hour and I'm paid twice that. That's kind of how they think. They really don't want to spend a lot of time on the boring stuff and they take the steps it takes to escape all of that. And that's, I think, the big differentiating factor. We can all talk about these things. These ideas are not new things that I invented. They've been around. Like We've all heard of outsourcing or automation. It's using them in a one-person business that I just don't see that many people doing. And if you use them all in combination, it's very powerful. It takes your business to a whole different level. And it's a journey, too. It's not like you're going to do it all this week. I've been setting up a new CRM system. I have to take classes on it. I can't do it all in one week. You know, This week, I have one appointment to learn one part of it. You have to make that commitment because if you don't, you'll never have these systems in place. As we begin to wrap up here... One question I wanted to ask you is what are one or two things that you do differently? Because like when you work on a message, you compile it into a book and then you put it out there for the public to consume. I always feel like you're put in a position to kind of live something out maybe in a different way or you're like, huh, now that I've written this, I should go forward and do likewise. Is there anything you've shifted or changed in your own business after writing the book? Well, it's definitely made my life a little more public. It's very interesting to me because I've been a journalist for so long and I've had my articles out there and I've always had some contact with the public through that, but I've been doing more speaking and doing more shows like yours. And it's actually really fun. I love I love meeting the readers and hearing their questions, especially when we can talk one-on-one -on -one because sometimes I think, oh, wow, you know what? I should have written about that in the book. So if I do something else along these lines, I'll definitely keep that in mind or you know, people are not understanding that part of it. And I think with anything, it's like you can hold off forever on any big project and say, you know, I'm going to just keep rewriting it for the next 10 years. And then the moment will have passed. Nobody will be interested in it. So you have to get it out there. Let the world react to it. Put it in the court of public opinion. And sometimes it's like your child, you know, like you see your child on stage in a school play and you're like, <laughs> and it's like, oh, I hope they don't forget their line. You know, it, you, you feel very protective of it, but you have to put your ego aside, I think, and just say, wait a minute, you know, if that person didn't like that one part of it, maybe there's a message in it for me. Maybe I can learn something from it. And you know what? I'm better off having done it than not done it. It's funny. One of my interesting moments in life of a couple of years ago, I, I told you I take Taekwondo with two of my daughters. I thought it was a good thing for kids to have, you know, just for self-discipline, fitness, et cetera. So I was sitting there on the sidelines and I saw there was a mom taking the class with her son. I'm like, there weren't that many women and girls. And I thought, well, if she could do it, I can do it also. And then one day the teacher said, we're having a tournament and we expect everybody to participate. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not participating in the tour. I didn't say that to him, but I was like, I thought it was only for the kids, you know? <laughs> so I remember I was with my daughter. I think what, at the, not two of my daughters do, but I think only one of them was doing it at that point. And it's the winter and we're driving across the ice to the tournament. And it was like, I had to force myself to keep my hands on the steering wheel and keep driving. 
I wanted to turn around so badly because I literally had to get in the ring in front of all these parents from my community and other people fight with this other woman. <laughs> I was like, you know, I was like doing it for the workouts and things. And I did it, you know, I, I, I got in there and I did it. And because I didn't want to disappoint my daughter or look like, oh, this isn't something girls can do or whatever. But it was just, I'll never forget it, honestly. And I had to do another one after that. But that one was just the first time I ever did anything like it. And after that, I realized, you know, you can sit on the sidelines and not do something and just say you could have done it or should have done it or someday you're going to get around to do it because you're afraid of what other people will think. But I think once I got over that, I was like, all right, that was probably one of the most embarrassing things I've ever done. <laughs> you know? and, and I got over it, right? And I lived to tell the tale. And it wasn't really that bad. So I can do this too. You know, and I would encourage people who are, anybody who has a creative project in them, there's so many people that, you know, that can pick it apart. And we're like in the age of reviews and things like that. But I think I felt like I had an important message for people. I felt like I could help people with this book. And I felt these stories were unique. People were not telling the story. The media generally has a different take on this than I did. And I felt it was something worth telling. And so I just went with that feeling. And I feel like the book will find the right people it's meant to find. And I think you have to take that attitude. You know, you're going to go out there and not everything is going to have been perfect. And if you're a perfectionist, you just won't do anything. It's an interesting thing because you get out there and you're talking to people and you're like, oh, I hope they didn't hate the book or <laughs> whatever. But mostly I think people have been very positive because it's something nobody really acknowledged these one person businesses. I think people have felt like, wow, like what I'm doing is looked at as almost a failure. You know, I didn't read the e-myth. I didn't scale. I'm not in Silicon Valley raising venture capital. But they deep down don't really want that stuff. Who wants to, I mean, I guess some people do, but like, to me, it sounds very unappealing to be working 24 seven in a startup incubator, drinking Soylent so that a venture capitalist can cash in on what I'm doing. You know, it's, I mean, I'm not saying they don't have big exits and it's not exciting, but that's because I'm a different person for someone else. That's like all in, you know, it's super exciting. You know, we're going to, and they have a completely different perspective. There's so much variety in the world. But I think this this side of the world, now you're going to hear some little voices of my kids coming in as well. <laughs> so they may even say hello. It, it just, I think, unrecognized. But I, you know, I'm hoping to give voice to these folks, and I'm hoping to hear from more. I have been hearing from from other interesting people that are breaking one million, and I'm hoping to tell more of those stories. So if any of your listeners and watchers are <laughs> are in that category, I'd love to hear from them as well as one person businesses that even are nowhere near that, but just have an interesting business model because those stories are relatable too. not everybody I should say needs to break 1 million. Some people live in a very low cost of living place. They may not have dependents for one person, $60,000 in revenue might be all they need. And there's no reason to force yourself to make more. But I think it's good to have a revenue benchmark because of the costs that we talked about. It really just means the difference between living in a state of stress and panic and living in a state of, okay, I can take care of that. I may not live like a king or queen, but I can pay my bills if something unexpected comes along. It's not a big deal. I get invited to a wedding. I can go. I don't feel like I have to say no because of the plane ticket. You know, that's kind of where I want to help people to be. And I think a lot of freelancers are really not at that point yet, but they're very capable of it. They just don't know how to get there. And these folks were so generous. I mean, they really, it was so different for me because I interviewed corporate CEOs too. They're so close to the vest. They have like a whole communications team behind them, you know, making sure they say the right thing. These folks own the business and they can say whatever they want. And they're very nice about sharing what worked for them. And I think that's probably one of their success qualities that they have is that they are generous because they realize you, you don't exist in a vacuum in a one person business. And they do help other people without the expectation of somebody paying them back directly in some other way. You know, I think it's just sort of a good vibe or whatever you want to call it they put out that makes other people help them in turn just because they're so nice. Well, Elaine, you've given us an education and a wealth of knowledge that you've shared with us today. So thank you for that. And she just scratched the surface. The book has way more meat and way more depth than that. So definitely go and check it out. It's going to be 
one of my top five reads I know for this year. David Amerlin's The Sniper Mind, another great book I recommend in my top five list. I don't know what I'm going to do for the rest of the year once I get to my five favorite books. I, I, everything else is going to pale in comparison. But Elaine, if people want to connect with you, if they want to find out more about the book, where are some of the places they can do that on the web? They can go to the website for the book, the million dollar one person business.com. There's a contact me box there, or they can go to my website and I'm going to spell my name. It's a mouthful, but I'm sure it's in the show notes. It's Elaine, E-L-A-I-N-E, Pofeld, P-O, F as in Frank, E-L as in Larry, D as in David, T as in Tom.com. So Elaine Pofeld.com, but check Sean's website. Everyone misspells it. <laughs> And you can find me there under that name on Twitter or on LinkedIn. I encourage you to connect with me because I've really met some very nice people through those those media. I'm on Facebook also to reach out whatever whatever social you use. I'm probably on and I, I'd love to hear about your business and what questions you have. And hopefully if you're in one of the places I'll be speaking, I'll get to meet you in person. Well, and like we do with every episode, I'll have detailed show notes. So once you're done listening, head on over to SeanTabbitt.com. I'll have links to places where you can buy the book, places where you connect with Elaine on social media. Uh, it's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Elaine Pofelt. Once again, our book today was The Million Dollar One Person Business. Make great money, work the way you like, have the life you want. Again, if you want to connect with Elaine and find out more about the book, you can either head on over to her website, and I will spell that. That's E-L-A-I-N-E-P-O-F-E-L-D-T.com or go to the million dollar one person business.com. And Elaine, I just want to say thanks so much for sharing with us today. It has been a great pleasure and an honor to speak with you. You over delivered on this interview. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Sean. I really enjoyed it. And I, I hope I get to meet you in person someday. That would be great. That's all for this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show. If you have a question or a comment, be sure to give me a shout out on social media or send an email to show at seantabbitt.com. The intro and outro music is from the song titled Jesus Loves You, written and performed by Casper McLeod. This song can be found on his album Faithfulness, which is available at theupperroomfellowship.org. Until next time, this is your host Sean Tabbitt, signing off. <laughs>